Please open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, and if you stand, I'll be reading verses 21 through 35 as we again and really continually look at this incredible parable of forgiveness that reminds us of what was done for us even during this Christmas season. And I pray that your hearts will be strengthened and yet also challenged at the challenge that Jesus gives to us that we are to forgive our brother from our heart. Matthew 18, verse 21, when then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, the Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had in repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling, and he went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. And summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in that same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if... Each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Please be seated. On this particular time of year, the world is looking for a little peace, a little comfort, a little hope. They try to find it in the perhaps the bustle of the season and the emotionality, the emotions of the season, trying to stir those up in a variety of ways. And of course, ever increasingly, they've separated any thought of Christ from what the season is all about. And, and again, I want to remind you this morning that there are only people who ought to be rejoicing in this season are Christians. There is no joy for those who do not know Christ, none. In fact, this season only reminds them, should only remind them of the fact that they are condemned, the fact that they are under the wrath of God, the fact that Jesus had to come was the reason, or the reason that he came was because we needed forgiveness, because we were rightfully condemned to eternal hell. And for us to pretend along with the world or to somehow to foster that false feeling in them is really does them an, an injustice. For us to all, let's join hands and sing and try to be happy and wish that the world would somehow not you know, bother us during this time and maybe would just you know, parrot words with us or, or say along with us that they love Jesus when they don't really just reveals, I think, a bit of our own laziness of heart when it comes to sharing the gospel. And so, while I long for you to have a joyful Christmas time, while I long for you to rejoice and love what the Lord has done for you, I also want us to be very careful that we don't kind of circle the wagons and rally around our family and perhaps even rally around our church and forget a world that is dying, the world that Jesus came to save. And so while you do all of those things, let your heart break for a world that is not forgiven because they have not sought that repentance. They have not recognized their need. You have. The Lord is gracious to you. And so we ought to rejoice. In fact, repentance and forgiveness ought to be the lifeblood of our relationships in this fallen world. Because we sin against one another regularly, we must become experts at seeking repentance and at extending forgiveness. This requires a continual development of a kind and tender heart towards one another, the very heart of God. This in turn requires great meekness. Arrogant people are not known for their tender heartedness. Thus, we once again come back to humility. When we recognize our sinful condemned state before a holy God and thus are grateful for his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness in Christ, we can more easily and consistently extend forgiveness to others because our pride is not getting in the way. And make no mistake, the Lord will do whatever is necessary to humble us so that we might be able to forgive. So what we'll see this morning again is that Jesus is the King to whom we humbly bend the knee in repentant thankfulness and through whom we are empowered for tender-hearted forgiveness of others. Jesus is the King 
to whom we humbly bend the knee in repentant thankfulness and through whom we are empowered for tender-hearted forgiveness of others. When we humbly bend the knee to Christ, we are quick to forgive others. Now, in Matthew 18, it's all about humility. Yes, church discipline is mentioned here, of course, but only in light of the humility necessary to even enter into the kingdom, the humility necessary to be the greatest in the kingdom. We need to be humble so that we might live properly within the kingdom. And even when we get to verse 15, when we're talking about church discipline, it's all about being the the humility necessary to confront sin properly. Again, arrogant people do not confront sin well. They do it harshly. They do it angrily. They do it with hypocrisy. So we must be bathed in humility if we're even going to confront sin, if we're going to recognize sin, because so often the things that we consider to be sins against us are simply things that bother us, they irritate us, they hurt our egos. They aren't even necessarily sins against a holy God. So confronting sin in the church requires tremendous humility. And then, of course, forgiving sin in the church requires humility as well. Every part of this requires us to remember who we are and, and from where we have been, from that which we have been saved, that we've been saved from the eternal wrath of God that we fully deserved. So we come to verse 21 where Peter asks, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother? And it's almost as always, this is incredible. How am I going to do this? If we confront sin and if people repent of that sin, then how can I continually forgive them over and over? And how often should I do that? He's already trying to kind of set up a, a, a boundary for forgiveness, but Jesus doesn't set one up. God does not have a boundary on forgiveness. And aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that he does not say, this far and no farther, I'll forgive you up to this point, but you're done after that because we would all be done. We would all be finished. And so Jesus says, no, I don't say to you seven times. I say to you 70 times seven. I say to you an infinite amount. I say to you that, that forgiveness knows no limit because the heart of God for, in love of his people and in desire to forgive them and in the sufficient merit of Christ, it knows no limit. Think of it this way. When you, when you choose to, to not forgive one, when you, someone, when you say, I'm not going to forgive you, you are limiting the merit of Jesus. That's essentially what you're saying. Jesus could forgive and he could forgive infinitely, but I can't and I won't. And so Jesus really makes a, a, a stunning application to the parable that he then provides of this, of this slave who is forgiven an infinite debt, essentially, and then refuses to forgive others. And he says, this is what you must do. And in fact, God responds very strongly to those who do not forgive. Yes, he, res- he responds strongly to those who, who don't repent. In fact, so strongly that they're to be set outside the church if they're believers in the church and they refuse to repent. That, that's strong. And yet, it's equally strong for those who would refuse to forgive those who have repented and those who would refuse, as we will see, to forgive in their hearts, really of any sin against them. And we've been working our way through the aspects of forgiveness then, more the practical nature of it as it flows out of the theology of forgiveness because this is an area that we wrestle with. We're not experts at forgiveness, and we ought to be. If there's anything we ought to be good at, it ought to be forgiving we can spend so much time, we've got to make sure our service is just right and our sound is just right and our building is just right and our stuff is just right and our communication is just right and our emails are fine and our tweets are fine and all that is fine. How about forgiveness? Are you an expert? Do you forgive quickly? Do you forgive completely? Is it your heart to forgive at all times, longing to extend that? Do you know the nuances of forgiveness? Someone continues to sin, so what do you do? You're wrestling with a hard heart, so what do you do? We ought to know all of these things and we ought to practice them over and over, which is why we're spending so much time on it because we're just not good at it. And we as Christians are called to be really, really good. In fact, we are called to be as good as our Savior who is perfect in his infinite forgiveness. So on the basis of the theology, so if you're under outline, forgiving as God in Christ is forgiven. Remember, we went to Ephesians 4.32 where Paul says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And that, of course, is the basis for everything. God the Father's longing to forgive and his ability to forgive on the basis of the person and work of Christ. Remember that this is a once-for-all work that Christ accomplished, and it is for every believer. Every believer has been fully forgiven in Christ. Christ, and that is our glory and our joy. Remember, all forgiveness points us back to Christ, and one of the reasons, the primary reason that we love to forgive is because we love to look like our Savior. We love to exalt our Savior. We love to love our Savior, and forgiveness is one of the primary ways that we do that. So it's all about Christ. 
It's all about our love of him. And again, one who does not forgive well does not love Christ well. That's the issue. Does not desire to exalt Christ well when we forgive poorly. So then we've been talking about the practical nature of forgiveness, the biblical and practical nature. Those are not two separate things. Biblical and practical are the same thing because the Bible does not tell us to do things that we cannot do and does not, it does not uh, ask us to go to the depths in areas where we are not given strength. We have the strength to forgive. Remember, we, in talking about forgiveness, we really there's two kinds, two aspects of forgiveness. There's this vertical forgiveness. That is God's forgiveness of us. And it is fundamentally different than our forgiveness of others because God's forgiveness of us has, has actual spiritual consequences from the standpoint of he absolves people of sin. He, Jesus truly took the wrath of God. Jesus made the full payment. He canceled our debt. He cleansed us from sin. So when God forgives, it is a true forgiveness. There is a real transaction taking place for all of eternity. That's the way that God forgives, and that's the forgiveness we must have. And the only way that we can receive that forgiveness is through repentance and faith repenting of our sin and trusting in Christ. But your horizontal forgiveness, and remember, that's the removal of the relational damages of sin on the basis of Christ's example. You are not actually absolving anyone of sin when you forgive them. Jesus did that, and he is ultimately responsible of doing it for them because you're even going to forgive unbelievers who have not, in the bigger sense, been forgiven, so you are not in any way absolving them of their sin. In fact, as we will see, you can forgive someone Upon, whom's God, upon whom God's wrath is still coming, or even forgiving believers who are not really repenting well, and so God continues to visit discipline on them. He will deal with them. You are called to forgive them. You are called to extend that forgiveness on the basis of Christ's example. You are not somehow taking the power of Christ and washing them clean. God does that. And so we have this horizontal relational forgiveness that we are called to extend both internally before the Lord and externally before the other person. So this horizontal forgiveness is granted internally on the basis of the love and mercy exemplified in Christ. And then where there's relational breach, it is received relationally through repentance and confession to one another. But again, remember, when you repent to someone else, the bigger picture is uh, that's, a, that's a horizontal transaction taking place. Fundamentally, what needs to have happened, you should have repented before a holy God. That's first and foremost. So even repentance to someone else is not an actual spiritual transaction in that sense. God has to forgive you. You have to repent before him. And then the relational aspects are worked out between one another on the basis of what has happened before a holy God in your heart. That's essential. Repentance asked for should be repentance already granted or asked for from God. Forgiveness given certainly must already have been a transaction that happened before holy God. You forgave the sin in light of the work of Christ and you forgave that person. So let's review just a tad all of the things that we've said already about forgiveness. Forgiveness is reciprocal. We are to forgive one another. The indication is we will constantly sin against each other. This is a back and forth transaction. So that when we are forgiving others, we are recognizing that we will at one point need to be forgiven as well. And so we should be quick to extend it, knowing that we're going to need to receive it. This is certainly true in your family, and no less true in the body of Christ. The more time we spend with one another, this, this reciprocal forgiveness, forgiving each other back and forth is essential. Forgiveness is graceful. It is full of grace. It is never deserved. So it's never demanded. You must forgive me. You know what's asked for? Continue. We ask God for forgiveness, but we do not demand. We ask because we know we need it. We ask because it humbles us to the core to recognize that we need to be forgiven. And we never demand this from others. Because any time it is extended, it is always full of grace. We never deserved it. Forgiveness, remember, is kind and tender-hearted. That's really the fundamental verb in Ephesians 4.32. The verb is be kind to one another. The resulting action is forgive. And so to the extent that you forgive, you are kind and tenderhearted. To the extent that you refuse to forgive, you are being hard-hearted. That is, you are, are refusing to recognize the plight of someone trapped in sin or harmed by sin. You are refusing to recognize the need for the work and grace of God to be poured out upon them. And so you are withholding that. You are not being a conduit of grace. You are not extending the kindness and tenderheartedness of God to someone else. Forgiveness, remember we said, is also commanded. 
This is something that you have to do. You, you aren't, you aren't, God is not suggesting that you forgive. He is commanding you to forgive, and therefore forgiveness is willful. You extend your will to do that whether you want to do it or not. Obedience is not based on feeling. It is not based on what you want to do. Although increasingly, of course, the true believer wants to do what God wants. But we live in a fallen world and we are fallen people. And there's often times when we don't want to extend forgiveness. And so we make excuses like, well, I don't feel like extending forgiveness now. Or it'll be hypocritical if I give you forgiveness. Or I, I, need, I need time. We're going to talk about what it means to need time. I get that because we are sinful people. But that, that's an inappropriate response. Uh, you know, in a couple years, I'll forgive you. A couple months. I mean, how long is it going to take? How long are you going to take to work out the issue before a holy God that requires for you to forgive? It's willful. But remember that if it's, again, commanded and willful, that you always have the resources necessary to accomplish it. You can always forgive. And that is a tremendous blessing because the world can't really ever forgive. Ever because they don't have any basis upon which to do that. They can say the words. They can try to fix things up relationally. They can do the best they can. It's an echo of forgiveness. It's not real. It doesn't really change the heart. In fact, forgiveness tends to make people arrogant. I forgave you. Look how great I am. That, that's about the only thing it does. But for real believers, for true believers, you are empowered to forgive. And so you can truly release that sin so that of, the, of the other person against you so that you, your life isn't destroyed by it. How many people... How many relationships, how many families would be transformed if people could truly forgive? And so it is a travesty when believers don't because it's killing you and it's harming others when you refuse to forgive. But you can. Christ came that you could. He provided the legal basis upon which that is able to be accomplished and he provided the, the, the relational strength, power, and wisdom necessary as the Spirit of God lives within your heart. So let's begin this morning with forgiveness is immediate. I'm really actually backing up. We, that was the last one we covered last week. But I had some questions about this from others. And I, I think it's good to, to work our way through this a bit. Forgiveness should be immediate. Why? That's the nature of God's forgiveness. He doesn't wait. We cry out to him to, for, for forgiveness. He doesn't say, well, in a couple of days. And after you've demonstrated some things to me, I would like you to show me the reality of that forgiveness. So I'll forgive you when you've done these five things that demonstrate the reality of it. Then I'll forgive you. God does not do that. He forgives you immediately. He forgives you totally. He forgives you completely. He forgives you eternally. That's the way our forgiveness is supposed to be. But, well, what's the but? We are sinners. We're not God. And so we wrestle to extend this kind of forgiveness. And we certainly wrestle to do it immediately. And yet this is our goal. And I would ask you, is this always your goal? And really, fundamentally, with this issue, if you're going to wait to forgive, that is, you feel like, I just, I cannot do this right now. One, how long? And two, is it when you say that your goal to pursue forgiveness before the Lord as your primary work until such time as you grant that forgiveness, until such time you say, well, now I'm ready. And again, I would ask you, at what point are you ready? When you feel like it? What has to change in the situation for you to forgive. And here's the real danger of a belief that says, until someone comes and apologizes to me, I cannot biblically forgive and I will not do so because they may never come. And so what are you going to do with that in your heart? How long? And, and if you're going to wait, how long will it be? No, the forgiveness comes immediately. Mark 11:25. 25. Whenever you stand praying, how often are you to pray? Continually, all the time devoting yourself to prayer. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. Or someone say, well, that, that's just people who have come and have repented to you and you refuse to forgive them. And so if you've done that, it doesn't say that. It says, if you have anything against anyone, that is sins, whether they have confessed them to you or not, whether they've repented for them or not, if someone has sinned against you and that is, you are harboring that in your heart, you are holding that against them, every time you pray, you are to forgive. And so if you're going to wait to forgive, you're going to have to wait to pray. And if you wait to pray, you are in serious trouble because prayer is the lifeblood of every believer. It is our very breathing. And if you cannot pray, then you cannot access God. Your, your relationship with God is severely restricted and your ability to serve and honor God is harmed 
And so your prayer needs to be continually then, Lord, I must forgive. Help me forgive. Please, I choose to forgive. So that, that's all you're praying about until such time as you extend that forgiveness. There's nothing else to say because God isn't hearing you. It's like a husband who is, refuses to forgive or love his wife and he's praying to the Lord all these things that he wants. And the Bible says in, in 1 Peter, look, if you don't live with your wife in an understanding way, your prayers are hindered. You can pray till you're blue in the face and God is saying, love your wife. In fact, the only prayer you ought to be praying is, help me love my wife in an understanding way. And when you do that, then God will be responding to you. I understand that he hears you in the bigger sense. Don't outlogic yourself here. I understand that in the bigger sense, even God has forgiven you of your sins for all of eternity. But I also understand that in a relational, moment-by-moment, actual way, when you aren't forgiving, he's not hearing your prayers from the standpoint he's not actively working to answer them. It's a devastating thought for the believer. So when you stand praying, forgive. It's to be immediate. As we said, you're not a hypocrite if you forgive when you don't feel like it because that's actually true maturity. Increasingly, you want your feelings to match with what you ought to do, but you can't force that to happen. And that won't happen really fully until we're in heaven. Won't it be a delightful thing in heaven when your feelings work perfectly and you will always rejoice in the right thing and you will always have a proper full out passion for Christ but that doesn't happen now and so we choose to do it when we don't feel like it and yet it has to be done by faith see it would be hypocritical if you are doing it on the basis of well I'm just going to do I was told to do this I'm just going to do this it has nothing to do with God really I'm just going to you know make this happen well that's not that's not real forgiveness it's by faith Lord I trust you I know that this is what you want me to do I believe you I love you I want to exalt you. And that's by faith. You're not feeling that at the moment. The person has harmed you. It's difficult. It's the 50th. It's the 100th. It's the 500th time that they've done this. You know, I don't know. I'm not feeling this at all. And God, I'm not feeling much love for you right now either because I'm getting harmed by this every single time. And I'm wondering why you're letting this happen, right? That's what keeps us from forgiving. We're angry at the Lord oftentimes. We're angry at the other person. And so we don't want to forgive. A love of God and love of others is devoid in our hearts. That's the problem. And yet, are you going to wait until the feeling returns? Are you going to wait until God changes the circumstance so you can then forgive? That's what we want to do. God, when you make things better, I'll forgive. When that person responds to me, I'll forgive. When I feel better, I'll forgive. It is on the basis of faith that we forgive. And it's really on the basis of faith that we love. I know you. I know who you are. I know what you've done. I don't see you, says 1 Peter chapter 1. But I believe in you. And because I believe in you, I love you. And I love you on the basis of faith. And I forgive on the basis of faith. Because that transforms everything. Everything you do is by faith. There may or may not be feelings. You are to have affections towards God. But those, those affections do not always result in the proper feelings. They're not the same. An affection after God, a desire for Him does not properly express itself through our feelings. Otherwise, we would always be joyful because every Christian has affections after Jesus or they're not Christians. Every believer has a heart that loves Jesus because the Spirit of God lives inside of them and He loves Jesus. You cannot quell a love for Jesus in the heart of a true believer because the Spirit of God lives there, but it flows through broken feelings. That affection does not flow properly because we're sinful. Neither does your forgiveness then. And so it is by faith. That should release you. Faith is not fake. Faith is real, a real object based on a real desire in the heart to express those things to the Lord. And so we forgive immediately because we forgive by faith. And where and when can we not access God by faith? Never. Never. I hope, that, I hope you just rejoice in that. You don't have to wait for anything. Faith accesses the Father continually, and there is no waiting period. Now, what if you are still saying, I'm just not ready? You can't force me to do this. I, I can't. I understand that. Let's talk about a couple of things. It's legitimate to, to have that wrestle because we are sinful people who struggle to have kind, tender hearts. And admittedly, and additionally, the sins committed against us can be very grievous, very the biblical issue is very serious. We must forgive, so we must devote our time 
and prayer and spiritual energy towards forgiving and it needs to come as soon as possible. And as I've said, it really needs to be the only thing we're devoting ourselves to until such time as we forgive. That will shorten the amount of time. If you're doing nothing else except seeking God that he would enable you to forgive, then you're going to need to forgive pretty quickly because you have other things to do. You need to care for your family, you need to go to work, you need to do these things. So if you're going to wait, it's not going to be able to be very long because you're going to have to devote every spiritual energy towards it. We are sinning, we're grieving God, we're harming others, and so we are called to forgive immediately. You see, forgiveness is really what? It's the flip side of repentance. So can you say to God, I'm not ready to repent. Sorry, I mean, I'll work that up. In in a little while, I'll be ready, and so you just need to wait. Again, we're sinful people, that we wrestle to repent. I understand that. But can we give any excuse why I don't need to do that? No, if you aren't repenting, kind of on the other side, you, you need to be spending every waking moment seeking the Lord to repent. It's, it's, this is true even, for example, in, when it comes to salvation, we are to pursue salvation. There's some who sit and go, well, you know, I, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need to repent. I'm just either not ready or I don't understand it or I, I'm not sure how to do it. You pursue it. This is what you do. You, you, you run after God. Well, I'm an unbeliever. I can't do that. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says pursue God. The Bible says seek him. We seek the narrow gate. So even when it comes to an understanding of the first time forgiveness, we're seeking it. And first time repentance, it's the same for us. Whether we forgive or repent, we are to seek it until such time as it happens and we are to set other things aside because we are being harmed and God is not hearing our prayers. Now, remember the application here. You don't demand immediate forgiveness. We said that last week. So you're, you're there, you've sinned against someone and the sin is grievous and you want it off your conscience and you want it off the relationship and so you come and ask for forgiveness and maybe it was very sincere but then they're wrestling to do so and you're like, come on, I'm waiting. And we just had the sermon. Bring it on. As I said, be done. You, you're, not, you're not repenting. You just want to get it off your conscience. You just want the relational thing to be done. So you ask your spouse or you ask your parents, are you fine? Have you forgiven me yet? Are we okay? Is it all right? It's not about actual forgiveness. It's just about you feeling better. If men and women would just solve this issue, particularly in marriages where you've repented or where something's gone wrong, it's just constant. Is it okay? How are we done yet? Are you well? Why, why, why does your face look like that? Have you forgiven me? Well, why did you give me that look? Are, are you sure? Because you're just demanding something that, that is, is harming the relationship. You trust the Lord. If they're going to forgive you, you wait upon the Lord for them to do that, and you trust that they have, and you don't analyze every look they give you for the next six years. Have you really for? That's not up to you. And it would solve so many things if when we asked for forgiveness, it was because we recognized our desperate need and not because we wanted to somehow manipulate the situation so we just felt better about ourselves and about the marriage or about, the, about the, the sibling relationship, whatever it might be, because this would, it would solve a lot of problems. So you don't demand immediate forgiveness, but you don't sinfully retreat from extending forgiveness. Well, it's not time, I'm not ready, I can't do it yet, so I, just, I need time. Well, how much and how long? And how, you, know, you, you always are expecting that you will come back as soon as possible, really before you do much of anything else. So you know, you're saying, oh, you know, I'll, I'll forgive you when I'm ready, and then you're off doing the housework. I don't think so. You're on your knees before a holy God seeking to, to, to cry out to him that you, would, that you would choose to repent. You're not over watching TV. You're not wa- walking out the door to work. You're going to have to truly, it's not, you know, I'll put, I'll, I'll put that on hold. I'll do everything else and then I'll get back to forgiving you later. No, it needs to be right now. So forgiveness is, immediate forgiveness is continual. This is the whole point of Jesus' parable that it is on and on and on that it has no limit. We don't stop forgiving someone for offenses against us. Luke 17, 3, sister passage of this, be on your guard if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times a day, a a day, not seven times total, right? Seven times a day and returns to you seven times a day saying, I repent, you do what? You forgive him. And as I said before, that's not if and only if he returns that you forgive him. It certainly is when he returns and says, I repent, yes, I forgive you. But as we've said, and as we'll see again in just a moment, that forgiveness already took place in your heart. You were ready to extend it relationally because you'd already extended it before the Lord. He was forgiven. You were praying while he was gone, right? So he sinned against you the one time, and then he went away, and, and he didn't ask for forgiveness right away. But you forgave him before the Lord because you were trying to pray, and you couldn't pray before you forgave this guy. And then he comes back again, 
and, and you say, I forgive you, and it's on the basis of what you've already done. Then he sins right away again, and then you're still trying to pray, so again you forgive him in your heart before the Lord, and then he comes back and you're able to forgive him over and over and over. It's continual. However, however, and, and the question, of course, arises in your mind, now wait a minute. If he's continually coming back seven times a day, who sins the same way seven times a day? I do. You do. Yeah, raise your hand. Oh, you can raise it with me because that's every single one of you. All right? Now, you might not commit the exact same sin seven times a day. So, so maybe there's some sins you don't do seven times. But we certainly sin at least that often. And we certainly sin oftentimes the same way over and over. I mean, how many of you have been angry seven times a day? Again, don't raise your hand. How many of you have been bitter seven times a day? How many of you have had a lustful thought seven times a day? Okay, on and on. And so certainly we do this. And so our question comes, well, are they really repenting then? I mean, seven times a day, that can't be real repentance because we, we've been taught that. If you have to repent of it over and over and over, it's not real. I hope that isn't true because I've had to repent of things over and over and over and I believe the repentance was real. It's not complete from the standpoint I'm a sinner. But each time I hated it, each time I wanted to change it and then I sinned again. And it's a, a joy to know that the Lord continues to forgive me. But it may be that as this begins to happen, we see a pattern that indicates a lack of true repentance. They might not understand what repentance is. They might be just verbalizing and just mouthing it because they know that that's what they're supposed to do. All of these things. So when that is true, I ask you, so then at some point, do you stop forgiving? So they come, you're pretty sure it isn't real. This is the, this is the 15th time, maybe, in one day. And they come back and you're like, you know, Jesus said seven, so no. So I don't think that's real. And you start working them through, all right, let's understand why this doesn't appear to be real because you keep coming back to me on the same thing. So I'm not sure you're dealing with this properly. But as you're doing that, are you refusing to forgive them until you think it's real? I mean, I ask you, how long are you going to do that? And what kind of heart are you going to have towards them if you are saying, well, you know, I have no heart of forgiveness towards you. You just keep doing this thing. You're not really repentant. And I'm going to try to help you learn what it means to actually repent, even though I'm not forgiving you. So you're going to have to forgive in your heart anyway. There's never a time when you can say, well, I don't think it was real repentance, so I'm going to refuse to forgive you. Now, again, the relate, you might be saying to them, okay, I am forgiving you in my heart, certainly, and even relationally, I, I long for this relationship to be right. But what you need to understand is that as you keep doing this over and over, and as you demonstrate a lack of, of truly understanding what repentance is, our relationship is not being healed here. Right? I'm forgiving you. And I will continue to forgive you, but this relationship is not being healed because you're not repenting or it doesn't seem that you are. So you can work through those things and you can talk about that kind of thing, but you're going to have to continue to forgive. And you're not going to say, well, you know, I'm sorry, it's just not real this time. Or maybe, if, you know, maybe next time when I think it is, you're going to forgive each time. Even as you work them through what it means to truly repent. Because there's not, not caveats about this forgiveness. And how would you do that anyway? I'll forgive you when I think it's real. Well, how do you know? And so you continue to extend forgiveness. This will solve a lot of problems because the Lord isn't, hold, hear me, the Lord is not holding you accountable to make them repent. And it isn't your forgiveness that somehow makes, absolves them before God. If they aren't truly repentant, God will deal with it. You don't have to. Just extend forgiveness. They're asking for it. You extend it. I'm not saying you don't deal with things biblically. Look, it's, I don't think that's real repentance. Let's work our way through it. It's still harmful. You don't seem to be changing. Let's do all of that. But God deals with them. Again, understand that your forgiveness is not absolution. You're not relieving them from the penalty of sin if they haven't really repented. You are simply seeking to make sure that that relationship stays open and where the relational damage is being solved and where you truly before the Lord are not in a sinful way holding something against them. If they are not actually repenting, who is coming for them? God is coming for them. It's a fascinating example in the Bible of, of David leaving Jerusalem and when, when Absalom is coming to, to take his kingdom from him. And a man named Shammai, uh, the household of Saul, comes out and, and, and begins to, to throw dust at David and to curse him. And, and uh, Abishai, uh, his kind of the bodyguard of David, says, look, should I just kill this dead dog? And he says, No. If the Lord has given him this to do, this is what he needs to do. And so I'm not holding this personally against him. That's the idea. He's, he, if, if God's given him to do, then, then, then let him do it. But what we find out later on, David, is, is, he, is, uh, he gets to come back. Absalom is defeated. And he tells Solomon, uh, 
he says, look, Shammai came out and he cursed me. That was, uh, I am the anointed, as it were. I, I, I'm the king. He's not supposed to do that. That's a sin before a holy God. So I forgave it, as it were. But you know what you ought to do to him. And, and, if, and if he refuses to follow the rules then of what it looks like to be in response to the king properly, then he's dead. And what it, if you know the story, you know what happened to Shema. If you've been reading your, you know, your, your uh, yearly Bible reading and working this way through this over and over, well, Shema decided at some point along the way that he wasn't going to come underneath Solomon's authority. And he disobeyed that, and he was killed. So David forgave, as it were. There's a relation. Look, let him do that. That's, that that's, if the Lord has given him this to do. But there was still an answering before God that needed to happen. So that's what you need to understand about forgiveness. You extend it. God is the one who deals with the, with the true ramifications of what's really going on. And as you help someone work through what it is to truly repent, you keep forgiving over and over. It doesn't seem real to me. How do you know? Continue to forgive. And I would ask you, if it's an unbeliever, maybe you have unbelieving children. Maybe. You, you all had unbelieving children at some point. You had to forgive them, right? And was their repentance real? Not a single time. Not once. They weren't believers. You're teaching them that. You're showing them how to do that. You want them to try to do that relationally. And you continue to extend forgiveness to them, even though it wasn't real. It was a relational forgiveness that you were extending, even as you taught them what it really means to repent. So could you say, well, I'm never going to forgive my unbelieving child until they come to Christ? No, every time. And you demonstrate that to them, even as you're calling them. And as I do to my children, they come, they say, Dad, I'm sorry, I forgive you. And yet you, you, are, you, you, don't, you claim that you don't even know Christ because some of my children do. And so I forgive you relationally. That I'm, I'm forgiving you, I'm loving you, okay, but you have a bigger problem. And the problem is that you don't have forgiveness from God. You have it from me. Absolutely, every single time you have forgiveness from me. But you don't have it once, right now, from God, not once. And you need it more from him than you do from me. See, here's the thing. That can be the danger, right? You're forgiving them. The relationship is good. And, 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 they're, and they're living on that. It's wonderful. And yet, if you're not challenging them that they need to be right before a holy God. See, you're not. Imagine as a parent, I refuse to forgive you. I'm going to be bitter and angry against you to make you feel like you need to repent before a holy God. How is that going to help you? If I extend forgiveness to them, they'll take forgiveness from God for granted. Well, they might, but that's not your fault. You're teaching them properly and extending the proper forgiveness. You, you're not going to really extract a, a confession towards God or true repentance before God by refusing to forgive someone else. So many ways we get this wrong in our heads that we'll somehow make it. If we forgive them too easily, then they won't repent before a holy God. That's not up to you. Teach them properly. Hold them accountable in proper biblical ways and continue to forgive. You might be saying at this point, I don't have a faith for, faith for that. Isn't that the beauty of faith? If you have any faith at all, you have enough faith for that. Remember that the disciples cried out to Jesus. They said, Lord, increase our faith in Luke 17, 5. And Jesus then told them a story about the, the fact that as a, as, a, as a slave before God, we just do the things that we're supposed to do. And when we do that, that's we've done no more than we ought. And he's not saying that God doesn't appreciate the depths of obedience. He's only saying that at when we truly have faith, we are able to do what God commands us to do. That's just the basic requirement. Exercise faith. And any amount of true faith is sufficient for your forgiveness to be continual. So we continue to forgive even when people are wrestling to truly repent, even as we work them through and step them through what that really means. I hope that will help you. I hope that will keep you from being bitter and I hope that will help you then truly continue to work with people even when it seems like they're not repenting while you continue to hold the relationship open so that you might properly be able to work with them rather than getting more and more bitter because you don't feel like the repentance is actually real and therefore your ability to actually instruct or help them repent is being marred every time you don't forgive. And they sense what is building, they sense what is going on, and so they're less responsive to you as well. Let the Lord deal with the overall nature of their sin. Work them through and talk them through what it means to forgive. And again, I understand that there's things around this. Sometimes the church has, is brought to bear when someone continues to sin and you are continuing to forgive them in your heart and yet there's consequences that have to happen. See, forgiveness doesn't eliminate consequences. That's huge for you to understand. When there's a necessary consequence to a sin, the fact that you forgave it does not undo that consequence. God forgave David's sin. When he confessed before the Lord to Nathan uh, of his sin against Bathsheba, God says through Nathan, look, you are forgiven, you won't die. 
all of the consequences that God had put into place as a result of that, his entire family being ravaged, that very thing we just referenced where he's being removed from the kingdom by his own son. God said, all that's still going to happen. I don't take away consequences, earthly consequences, on the basis of forgiveness. Heavenly consequences are removed. You will not go to hell. That's a great joy if you're a believer. But the earthly consequences are not removed. That, so when you forgive your kids, uh, but I'm still spanking you. Wait a minute, you forgave me. The consequences are supposed to be, no, no, no. Consequences come. It has nothing to do with my lack of forgiveness for you. Unless, of course, you spank them in anger, and then you didn't forgive them, and you need to put down the rod and walk away until such time as you can do that wisely and well. Okay, so, so consequences aren't removed by forgiveness, and sometimes very serious consequences happen in relationships, and yet you cannot be embittered Think of husbands and wives and when something has to happen and there has to be a separation or something, the church has to step in and say, we, gotta, we have to work through this problem. Does that mean the wife or the husband, depending on, on who they are, doesn't have to forgive in that case? Of course they do. And yet the consequences have to be stepped forward. That's why churches have to do this wisely and well in every situation. Well, next, forgiveness is forgetful. It's forgetful. Jeremiah 31, 34, they will not teach each other, each man his neighbor, excuse me, they will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for you, they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Now you know this, you've heard this, I, I hope you understand this, to forget does not mean that we can't remember, that God somehow, oh, I didn't know there was sin. How could he have continued the consequences in David's life if he forgot that David sinned? He didn't forget, he just didn't hold it against him. Even when he brought the consequences, he was, not, he was not holding it against David in some way that kept David from having a right relationship before the Lord. By the way, I hope that helps you as well. When you are under the ongoing consequences of your own sin, first, it never means that God hasn't truly forgiven you, and second, it means that you can be fully used of a holy God in the midst of consequences of your own sin. Isn't that incredible? You're not earning your forgiveness from God. You're not getting back into plan A. Well, I, I blew it and I had the sin and so I've got these consequences so I can't serve God. Of course you can. Fully and totally and completely as you have sought forgiveness, God has extended it to you and regardless of the consequences, you press on being maximally used by God. Again, David is your example. All kinds of problems in his kingdom and yet what does he say? God, I'm going to serve you. Right here, right now, in the fullness of, of every way that I possibly can and I'm going to continue to do that and God used him. So do not think that because you've had to be forgiven that somehow you're tainted. It doesn't even make any sense. You're in Christ. You're not tainted in Christ. And so you may fully and completely serve and honor the Lord even when you are suffering the consequences of sin because God always forgives. And by the way, that should be the way it is for you with others as well. So forgiveness is forgetful. It doesn't mean that God can't remember it. It means that he's not holding you accountable in a judicial sense for that sin. He's, you're not going to spend eternity in hell and relationally, that relationship is restored because you have asked for forgiveness. And so his, his kindness is on you, his relational kindness. Remember, his kindness is always on you. But his relational kindness, the, the joy of that relationship is once again restored. And so when we say we're going to forgive someone and that we're going to forget, it means this. I won't sinfully bring it up to you or others. I won't sinfully dwell on it. I will not use your sin as an excuse to sinfully retaliate against you in any way. And in this way, we move towards a true forgetting and that we no longer have to work so hard to put the remembrance of sin away. There is a sense in which you forget. Husbands, wives, some of you married 20, 30 years. When your wife sins against you in the same way that maybe it was even at the beginning of your marriage, what should it be like? It's new. It's new. I, I, don't, even, I don't remember. There's no baggage. I forgive you for that again, just like it had never happened, just like we were when we were dating or whatever you were doing, courtship sneaking around behind your parents' back. I don't know what you did. But I, I, I man, I just, I just let stuff go. And when, and when you sinned against me, I was like, oh, but I love you, babe. Why is it not like that now? Well, I'm a Christian and I have to hold you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Love them. It's like it's brand, and, you, and you're not like, well, you've always done this. That's why you're bitter. How do you know they've always done it? You forgot it, right? Right? You don't even know they've always done that because it's brand new. You keep making it, you keep, not keep, first time. I'm not saying you don't deal with it, you're dealing with it. But you're forgiving and you're not holding it against them. It really works the same way with your kids as well. I know there's consequences. They, oh, let's see, why are they not allowed to, oh yeah, they sin, I get that. And, and so that's the consequence, but there was no relational holdover. 
There wasn't, well, now there's that baggage you have to overcome because this is the 10th time you've stolen the, you know, the switch from uh, where it's supposed to be and played it in your bedroom. Uh, and so I'm not going to forgive you. Or I'm now angry at you. Or now it's going to take extra work. No, my forgiveness is total, complete, and clear right now. Because as far as the sin goes, I don't remember that you did that. And I'm going to love you. Wouldn't it be incredible? Wouldn't, wouldn't your relationship just be, be just released from all the stuff you think you've got to hold? God will deal with their sin judicially if there's something missing. God, they don't, no one ever escapes out from underneath the hand of a holy God when it comes to his dealing with their sin. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's not yours. And when we refuse to forgive, that's what we're saying. Vengeance is mine. I'm going to hold it. And I need to, I'm going to have to extract this out of you. God, God knows what he's doing. Do what he says. And then, you know, certainly, again, rightful consequences to discipline, all those sorts of things. But it's like the sin is new. No relational baggage ever. Now, again, I understand it's impossible for us at some level. It's not impossible for God. And so can I just encourage you with that again? God does not accumulate the consequent or the, the relational consequences of your sin. There are none in that sense. When he forgives, it's total. And you're not piling up a whole line of bitterness or I mean, it's harder for God to forgive you each time. It's total and complete because he actually truly in the right biblical way forgot it. He's not lying to you. And if we could just mimic that aspect of God, if we would just live that out, because your lives would be free. Not worrying that you had to somehow hold that against someone or somehow keeping it piling up against them. You would be free. Free. Forgiveness would free you. But understand that that's how it is if you're a believer between you and God. You're free. It's not accumulating. You don't have to beg him extra hard. You cry out to him, yes, in repentance. Well, that's the fifth time, God, so it's going to be a lot harder. What well, you ought to be looking in your heart. Am I really repenting? I get that. You ought to be like, oh, Lord, I don't want to do that. But you don't have to somehow get a little bit more moxie, a little bit more effort, and so you can get a little bit more forgiven. Instantaneous, total and complete every single time. We want to be like that. Forgiveness is restorational. Forgiveness is restorational. That is, it always desires that there would be a restoration to the relationship. And therefore, number five, because forgiveness always desires restoration, forgiveness must be, I couldn't think of a better term, I should have, unilateral. Okay, you know that. What does that mean? Forgiveness means between you and God first. Forgiving someone else starts with you forgiving them before God first. It's not something that has to have a transaction with another person first. I don't have time this morning to work through the theology of those that would hold that there has to be a, a personal transaction with someone who has sinned in order for you to forgive them. Okay, lots of people that you would respect and lots of people that I respect uh, hold that position in biblical counseling and others. Stuart Scott, Wayne Mack, there's a series of people who hold that particular position. I think it has some fundamental flaws and we don't have time to get into all of them. If you want to go back and get the lessons I did on Ephesians 4.32, I stepped through it in more detail. Not because I think there's something wrong with those guys or, or, their, or really in one sense their view of forgiveness. I just think it falls short of what the Bible actually says. So they would say, look, until someone has actually confessed to you, there cannot, you can't have actual forgiveness. They wouldn't just say the relationship can't be restored. They'd say you cannot, you must not really forgive. Why? Because God only forgives you when you ask for his forgiveness. I have two issues with that. One, it is true that no person is judicially, eternally forgiven of their sin before a holy God unless they repent. That is absolutely true. But I ask you this. Once you have, once God has granted you that kind of forgiveness... Does he ever overlook any of your sin? Think about it. Now, in the, again, in the bigger picture, no, because it was all taken in Christ. But do you sin daily? And do you confess every one of your sins to God? The answer is, you do not. You cannot. And God continues to extend forgiveness to you, even when you don't ask in that sense. And, and although he says that you are responsible, you never get every sin. And so I do think there's this whole aspect of God's forgiveness of you that although granted judicially and eternally in Christ, that there's a covering and an overlooking even of your ongoing sins, even as he, as he cries out to you and tells you in Scripture that you need to repent to him. You don't confess every sin. You spend a whole lot of time trying to get that done. It's our desire. And I think he then takes your desire to confess the sins you know, and in a relational covering, it, relationally, he covers the rest. Now that is on the basis of Christ's sacrifice, 
But that's the kind of thing you mimic. That is the basis of Christ's sacrifice of true forgiveness. It is on that basis that you forgive someone else over and over and over, and you forgive them in your heart first, even before they come. And even if they don't confess every sin to you. So forgiveness is in our heart. We already saw that in Matthew 11, 20, or Mark 11.25. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will forgive you. This is the kind of forgiveness that covers sin. And again, it covers it on the basis, again, of what Christ has done. That is, we extend this kind of forgiveness to others because we know that God has ultimately forgiven us and he will deal with them as, as they need to be dealt with and we can and do then extend to them a, a, a forgiveness which says, I don't hold that against you in my heart. And, and those who say, look, there has to be a transaction. You can't forgive. They're simply saying, you can't forgive in your heart. That's not actual forgiveness. That's just a readiness to forgive. But my issue with that is the Bible doesn't call it anything else. There is no other term. You are called to forgive. Mark says, forgive. Ephesians 4 says, forgive. Colossians 3 says, forgive. It's not be ready to forgive. It's not want to forgive. It's not wish to forgive. It's forgive. There's no other biblical term. It just means there's two ways to forgive. There's two transactions in forgiveness. One before God, complete, total, instantly. I forgive, and we do that on the basis of, 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 of having been forgiven by Christ. And then there's the forgiveness of someone else. So this covering works like this, Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up strife. Love covers all transgressions. It doesn't ignore them, but it does not hold that transgression against that person on a one-to-one correspondence every time they do it. Proverbs 17, 9. He who conceals a transgression seeks love. He repeats a matter, separates intimate friends. Proverbs 19.11, a man's discretion makes him slow to anger. It is his glory to overlook a transgression. Every time you're not coming after someone. If you Matthew 18, if we were to Matthew 18 someone every time, because that's essentially what you have to do. If, it ha- if there has to be a transaction of forgiveness, and if someone doesn't repent before you can forgive them, then the next thing is what? Two or three, then after two or three there's the church, and so every time someone doesn't repent of any sin, we put them out of the church. That is not the drive of Matthew 18. That is, not the, that is not the tone of the forgiveness asked for in Ephesians 4. It is less confrontational, not more. We only confront when we have to. When it's absolutely essential, when we've worked it through, no, this one has to be confronted because of the dangers. Well, I'll, I'll get to that maybe. Um, I'm going to try to get there because we, we need to work our way through it. So there's a forgiveness that covers sin. First Peter 4, 8, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. It does not demand a, a, a transaction of repentance for every sin. In effect, says MacArthur, a person who chooses to forgive resolves not to remember the offense, refuses to hold a grudge, relinquishes any claim on recompense, resists, resists the temptation to brood or retaliate. The offended party simply bears the insult. The offense is set aside, lovingly covered for Christ's sake. Not lovingly covered just because, for Christ's sake. His work is the basis upon which you set aside that offense against you because of what you were forgiven. For petty and unintentional offenses, this is the proper and loving way to forgive unilaterally, without confrontation, without stirring up strife. Consider Romans 12. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. So what if they're not at peace with you? What if they didn't confess to you? What if they didn't repent? What if they're still, they still view you as an enemy? What are you supposed to do? Continue to hate them? No, be at peace. You have to have forgiven to be at peace. It's the essential nature of peace is there has to have been forgiveness. They're not at peace with you. They haven't perhaps repented. They're still angry at whatever. You are called as far as it depends on you to be at peace with them and then to leave room for the wrath of God. Never take your own revenge, beloved. Leave room for the wrath of God. That's what you do. You let God do his work. If your enemy's hungry, then you what? You feed him. If he's thirsty, you give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. You've forgiven him. He's still, he's still angry at you. And yet you are then treating him with care and grace and kindness, all because you know God will deal with it judicially as he needs to. And you don't have to extract that from him by refusing to forgive. And as you do that, his conscience is activated and he repents. That's how that works. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You forgive in your heart and you forgive instantly and you forgive on the basis of the work of Christ for you and you do not hold it against the other person. Again, MacArthur, this I believe is what scripture refers to most often when it calls us to forgive one another, what I just described, this unilateral forgiveness. The heavy emphasis on forgiveness in scripture is not meant to make us more confrontational, but quite the opposite. When scripture calls us to have an attitude of forgiveness, the emphasis is always on long suffering, patience, benevolence, forbearance, kindness, and mercy, not confrontation. It's not that we don't confront, 
But that's not, that's not instantly what we're looking for. And that's so important. I think that's what Jesus, that is what Jesus is teaching in Matthew 18. Yes, we confront sin. Peter's like, all right, I'm ready to confront sin. And if they don't forgive, we're just, you know. No, really, our hearts, even as we confront sin, want to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. You might be asking, well, does, did, did Jesus demonstrate this? Well, yes, he did. You might remember when he was on the cross, what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them. But they don't know what they're doing, as it were. Was he absolving them of their sin in, in crucifying him? No. Was he demanding that God forgive, in one sense, every one of those who was there at the cross? No. He was expressing his heart to say, I don't hold this against them, as it were. Father, forgive them. And he was expressing that verbally so that we could hear it. That's the heart of God. Not one of them had said, Jesus, I'm sorry for putting you on the cross. Not one. And he said, Father, forgive them. Indicating what? He had. In that sense, in that relational sense, not taking it against himself. It was already forgiven. Were they forgiven eternally? No. But that's not up to us anyway. We never forgive someone eternally. And he's crying out that God would do that, that his heart would be, when they, when they repented in that sense, that they would be forgiven. How about Stephen? They went on stoning Stephen as he called out to the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. What, what does that have to mean that Stephen wasn't? How can he be calling on the Lord to do that? He wasn't. Not one of those Pharisees who threw the rock and hit him in the head walked up and said, oh, I'm so sorry. Stephen, I forgive you. I'm not holding that against you. As they were killing him, he was not holding it against them. That's the kind of forgiveness we're talking about. So you think, you think it's hard to do with a child or, or with, with your spouse. Imagine someone killing you. Well, when you say you're sorry, I'll forgive you. 